Like a lot of little girls, Melanie secretly believed that one day her daddy would marry her, maybe when she was 25. But on one terrible Saturday that she would never forget, right after daddy had come home from a trip overseas, he and mummy said they had an important announcement to make. They stood in front of the piano looking very serious. Daddy had presents from his trip and then they said they were getting divorced. Melanie couldn't believe it. This was something that happened on TV and in the movies. Now it had come to their house. Sometime after that, Melanie sat under the dining room table, pondering that ominous word, divorce. Then she went into her parents' bedroom. Daddy's things had disappeared. There were only mummy's things now, hairbrushes, makeup, bottles of perfume. Melanie wondered why Daddy had been in such a hurry to leave. She walked over to a cupboard at the end of the room and searched every shelf. Daddy had kept his things there. They were empty. There was only the smell of sandalwood and a single pair of socks left behind. The little girl picked them up and held them against her cheek. The weeks passed, winter came, Daddy didn't come back. Life went on for the little girl, but it didn't seem quite real. Slowly it began to dawn on her that Daddy must have some other life somewhere, some life which had nothing to do with the little girl who sometimes hid under the dining room table. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. Melanie's story, of course, is far from unique. Countless children like her have to try to adjust to the reality of an absent parent. But that adjustment is more difficult than we've assumed in the past. When fathers drop out of the family, it creates a hole that only becomes bigger as the decades pass. There's nothing quite as irreplaceable as an absent dad. In Australia, about one in five children live in a fatherless home. Of single parent families, 83% are headed by women. A recent census in France revealed that nearly two million children are growing up without fathers. 85% of single parents there are women and 90% in the United States. But these statistics relate only to physical absence. What's sometimes even more damaging is emotional absence. Many fathers have a hard time being there for their kids as a supporter and encourager, as well as a provider. Boys trying to grow up to be men without a healthy father figure around face tremendous obstacles. One leading counsellor summarised the emotional damage he's witnessed in the foreword title of his book, Absent Fathers, Lost Sons. For a long time, men have assumed that nurture and care are the mother's department. They're supposed to bring up the kids under the roof that dad provides. But those attitudes cheat our children of an invaluable source of support. Several studies have demonstrated that warmth and attention from dad produce confident, skillful boys and mature, independent girls. When dad's gone either physically or emotionally, there's a hole in the family that nothing else can fill, nothing else can replace. There is little that would have a greater impact on human life today than the return of fathers physically and emotionally to the home. Nothing would change the world more dramatically than filling that hole in the family. No revolution, no political reform, no government program. Nothing would make as great a difference as the return of dads. Aimless adolescents drifting into drugs or crime could use a father at home. Teenage girls about to give in to the sexual pressure all around them could use a father at home. Yes, a caring, strong father, what a difference he could make. But that's where we run into our big challenge. Many men didn't learn much about caring or supporting or being a source of moral strength from their own fathers. Distant fathers create distant sons and daughters. 
Personally, I was fortunate to have a wonderful Christian man for a father. But what about the many people who didn't? How can they learn to truly fill that hole in the family? How can they fill that irreplaceable role? One way to begin is to take to heart the material in a book like Hearts at Home. You'll find today's complete message in these pages and also other useful information about building solid families in a shaky world. So please call or visit our website. We'll have more information at the close of the program. Let me tell you about one father figure who's available to all of us, no matter what our family background. There's one father who can become a model for those who didn't have one growing up. And he's someone who can be very real for us. Now, perhaps you've already guessed that I'm talking about our Heavenly Father. You've heard that expression before. Maybe you're thinking that he hasn't done much in my life. Maybe you're thinking he's pretty distant himself. Well, I'd like to explain just what this father went through to get close to us and what he did to break through our typical male limitations. First of all, let's try to picture the kind of father we would want as a model. What's the opposite of a distant father? We don't just want to complain about the problem. We want to focus on the solution. We want to see if our Heavenly Father can be a practical solution. Ralph Bennett studies the matter of what kids need most in a dad, and he came up with four qualities. First of all, kids need a father who invests time with his family. Most men are driven to commit quite a bit of time to make a success of their careers. And it's hard for them to see time spent just being with the kids as a valuable investment. Clinical psychologist Ray Guarendi studied the long-term experience of 100 successful families. Listen to what he wrote about fathers. What kids remember most about their father is his simple presence. Some of the most important memories kids latch onto about their dads evolve from routine moments in family life. Spending time with the kids, it's a priceless investment. Nothing can take its place. Nothing we buy, nothing we work for, not even anything we say can take the place of time spent together. I have an incredibly busy schedule. It's overwhelming on occasion. But you know, I'm so thankful that I've managed to spend time with my kids just doing simple things they liked, camping or playing games with Jordan, Candace, Brittany and Natalie. Often we've been able to include them in our television and evangelistic work. I've invested my life as an evangelist in a lot of people around the world. But there's no investment I value more than those special times that I've had with my own kids. So let's ask ourselves, how does our Heavenly Father measure up in this area? Well, think about this. The God of the Bible wasn't content just to remain the great provider in the sky, sending down sunshine and rain, making the earth fruitful. He wasn't content to rule from a distance. God determined to come down and invest time with us. Listen to how the Apostle John described the Incarnation in John chapter 1 and verse 14. John describes God investing time with us in the person of His Son. John 1 verse 14. And the Word became flesh, that is Jesus Christ became flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There you have it. God decided that the best way to be our Heavenly Father was to come down and walk on dusty Galilean trails, to sail with fishermen on the Lake of Galilee and mingle with the Judean shepherds. What was God's great plan to show Himself to the world? It was simply this, to pour His life into 12 men, 12 disciples, to spend time with them almost every waking hour as a matter of fact, they saw how He lived every day, every moment. They came to understand what their Heavenly Father was really like. Do you have trouble investing time with your family? Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, is your model. Even if you had an earthly father who invested little quality time with you, remember God has invested everything in you. 
He's here through his spirit. He's committed himself to be by your side and he can make you into the father you want to be. What do kids need most in a dad? Well, the second thing is someone who will set limits. Limits create security for children. Someone described it this way. Imagine a child sitting in a chair in the middle of a dark, unfamiliar room. He'll find his way around very hesitantly at first. But as soon as he knows where the walls are, the limits of the space, then he will explore the room eagerly, full of curiosity and without fear. Setting limits involves discipline, not just punishment. As James Dobson says, punishment is something you do to a child. Discipline is something you do for a child. In other words, discipline is aimed at teaching the child something, correcting the child. Kids won't respect someone who merely reacts to situations, venting their anger. But they will respect someone who is firm in setting limits, someone who tries to correct and guide them. Many fathers run into problems in this area because they haven't been disciplined very well themselves. When little Johnny messes up, you might just explode or blow your top. Isn't that the way it's always been? No, there's another model, a model of fatherhood we can work from. And that model again is Jesus Christ especially in his relationship with his disciples. It wasn't easy trying to train those 12 men. Peter was bullheaded, always getting his foot in his mouth. Two brothers, James and John, had such bad tempers that they were called the sons of thunder. Thomas was slow to believe and Philip, he was simply slow, full stop. It was quite a challenge to disciple those 12 men. But Jesus invested his life in that challenge. He corrected their narrow picture of God by having them look at a shepherd with his sheep and a father with his prodigal son. He showed them what faith is and what it's all about and what it can do. He expressed disappointment when they backed away from the truth and great joy when they began to practice it. In short, Jesus disciplined his disciples. He had a clear goal in mind. Through all the ups and downs of their experiences, he kept guiding them firmly and gently toward the kingdom. And this experience created a tremendous bond between them. On one occasion, a crowd of people rejected Christ's teachings and were going away from him. Jesus asked the 12, do you also want to go away? This is what Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. There was nowhere else to go. Christ's patient teaching and correction had created a spiritual home for these men, a place where they belonged. Nothing could take that away from them. Friends, that's the kind of father I want to be. That's the kind of father everyone can know. Because God has come here. He wants to invest his life in each of us. We need to be discipled by Christ first before we can successfully discipline our children. What do kids need most in a dad? One final thing, perhaps the most important of all. They need a father who shows his love, a dad who demonstrates it. A family counsellor recently reported that one thing he hears the most in children is this. They say, I wish dad would tell me or show me that he really loves me. Time after time, pastors, psychologists and counsellors hear variations on this theme, a longing for affection that's expressed. You know, many men simply excuse themselves from this whole area. They say, well, I'm just not very good at showing my feelings outwardly. I provide for my family. I take care of things. That's how I demonstrate my love. I provide the physical needs for my family. But that excuse doesn't help our children. It doesn't fill that hole in the family. Love unexpressed is almost a contradiction in terms. If it isn't expressed, I'm not sure it exists in any meaningful sense. If we don't show our love, then love withers away, it dies.
You know, our Heavenly Father showed His great love in the most dramatic way possible. Think for a moment about Christ spreading out His arms on a hill called Golgotha. Jesus has been impaled on a cross. He's paying the ultimate penalty. His limbs are spiked to the wood. But that's not the only reason His arms are spread wide. There's a great deliberateness to everything that happens to this condemned man. Every word, every gesture is carefully measured. Christ on the cross is making a passionate statement about God's love for mankind, a statement about His eagerness to welcome us into His arms. He calls out, Father, forgive them. He gives assurance. You will be with me in paradise. He endures the worst that men and Satan can dish out until it is finished. All to demonstrate his incredible love. All to draw us to himself. Listen to how Paul views this great event in Romans 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates His love. He shows it graphically, a spectacle which a great crowd looks upon outside the gates of Jerusalem. He's vulnerable, exposed, torn, bleeding inside and out. God doesn't hold anything back, friends. He has shown us His love in a way we can never forget. This is the God who wants to love through us. This is the Heavenly Father who wants to parent through us. Whatever our emotional heartaches, whatever our emotional inadequacies, His love is big enough for the job. Yes, a Heavenly Father can help us fill that hole in our families. He can help us fill that irreplaceable role. He shows us what it really means to be present as a father. He shows us what it really means to invest our time, to discipline our children and demonstrate our love. He can turn absent fathers into nurturing fathers. Harold Hughes had never been there very much for his two young girls. He had the usual reasons. His trucking business ate up almost all his time. On those evenings when he wasn't on the road, he was often out entertaining business associates. But there was one problem in particular which kept Harold absent physically and emotionally. It was his drinking problem. He was an alcoholic. Even when his wife Eva tried to talk to him about it, he'd blow up, he'd explode. Sometimes his girls hid themselves in the closet when he came home. When sober, Harold noticed dark circles under his wife's eyes. Finally, Eva and the children left the house. This shocked him into making a solemn promise. He swore before a judge that he wouldn't touch liquor for a year. His family returned. A few weeks later, Harold travelled to a trucker's meeting. One morning, he woke up in his hotel room and noticed vomit in the bathroom. He didn't even remember his night of drinking. But one more promise had gone down the drain. Things kept getting worse after that. He was putting his family through a living hell and he knew it. So Harold decided to end it all one night in a bathtub with a 12-gauge shotgun. Before he pulled the trigger, however, he thought he'd best explain to God why he was doing this. That prayer proved to be the turning point of his life. He confessed himself a failure, a hopeless drunk, and asked for forgiveness. Harold felt that Christ came into his life that night. God the Father was very present, driving out the emptiness and self-hatred, filling him with his joy. And this man submitted himself to the discipline, to the discipleship of Christ. He learned what it means to be a father by spending time with the master. One evening shortly after his conversion, Harold was studying the Bible alone in his living room. He felt a nudge at his elbow and looked up. There were his two small daughters standing quietly in their nightgowns. He stared at them for a moment. They had changed so much and he had missed so much. Then Carol the youngest said, Daddy, we've come to kiss you goodnight. The father's eyes blurred. It had been such a long time since the children had come for his embrace. They were so fearful before. 
Now their beautiful clear eyes held no fear. Daddy had come home at last. Harold Hughes would go on to become a distinguished politician, receiving many public honours. But most important to him was that moment when he realised he'd finally filled the hole in his family. He'd finally fulfilled his irreplaceable role. His daughters wouldn't have to grow up like little Melanie, always wondering why Daddy had left for another life that had nothing to do with her. They would cherish a father who was truly present, truly there for them. Have you been absent as a father? Is there a hole in your family? I challenge you today to consider your one irreplaceable role. I ask you to think about the most important career that you can possibly have. Maybe you feel quite inadequate as a father. Maybe your background hasn't prepared you very well to be a supporter, a nurturer. But will you make a commitment with me today? Will you determine to allow Jesus Christ to turn you into the parent you are meant to be? Will you invest time in that relationship so that you can invest quality time with your children? Let's be there physically. Let's be there emotionally. Let's determine to come back home right now as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us what being a father is all about. We confess our failings as parents before you. We ask that you change us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. We need His love and discipline in our lives. We need His Spirit. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen.